Tanakoto Kato, and welcome to tonight's Auckland Astronomical Society lecture. I'm Michelle Bannister, and I'd like to talk to you tonight about the small worlds and planetary systems and what we've been able to know about them and how we've been able to discover the population of them that travel between stars and what those can tell us about their home systems and, in fact, how planetary systems form all across our galaxy. Now, I'm giving this to you via YouTube, so I can't see you folks. So please, if you have a question as we go through, I'll do a um, question session at the end as normal. But if you do have another question, I do have my phone. And uh, um, with that, I can get some idea of the uh, um, questions that you're asking. So please drop a question in the comments as we go through if you do have something you'd like me to stop and ch chat further about. So I've come back to New Zealand after about 12 years overseas. Um, I did my honours degree at the University of Canterbury um, as a dual degree in astronomy and geology. And I then went and did my PhD over in Australia and then partly also in the United States. And I worked a fair bit on both uh, um, geological aspects. I got to work with some moon rocks. That was really fun. Um, but primarily by trying to map the outer solar system. And I kept this kind of work up uh, in my first uh, postdoctoral fellowship, which is a thing that is uh, um, one of the research training jobs that you have as an astronomer. And uh, after being in Canada for my first uh, um, postdoctoral fellowship, I then went to, to Belfast in the United Kingdom for my second postdoc. And that's where I really started to pick up this uh, work on interstellar objects. And I moved back to New Zealand pretty recently, just uh, um, at the start of February. So it was about six weeks of normality before the current situation got going. The place to start thinking about planetary systems is in the birthplaces of new planets. And this image that you can see here is from the ALMA submillimeter um, telescope. So it's seeing in light at submillimeter wavelengths. And these disks of gas and dust, ALMA's picking up the signature of the dust primarily here. And this shows us the, the disks of material when new planetary systems are forming, the star in the center and this thin, uh, flattened disk of material that forms out of a um, part of a molecular cloud and clumps it into something where the star is turning on at the centre and planets are starting to form in that disk. And this planet formation in disks happens pretty fast. These disks are relatively short-lived, maybe less than a few million years. We have some signatures suggesting that the mean lifetimes of these disks are only maybe one to three million years. And while you have a bit of a tail of uh, um, lifetime on that, in general, planetary systems form fast. Somehow, you're going from dust the size of the dust bunnies under your sofa up to maybe grains of sand all the way up to planets, up to things the size of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And you're doing that in a few million years. So how does this happen? This is one of the biggest mysteries that we have in astronomy at the present, is in trying to figure out how this process happens, how you can go from something that's you know, on the order of 36 orders of magnitude and mass and to uh, a more than six orders of magnitude and size scale to make these kinds of planets. Well, we have some idea how this works. So we have time um, going across here and mass upwards on, this, on the y-axis. And, and this puts together some of the physical ideas that we have for how these mechanisms work. You have uh, um, dust starts to coagulate, then you have a physical mechanism called the streaming instability, which predominantly makes binary little planetesimals, little tiny building blocks of planets. And then biggest, the biggest ones of those can start having a process called pebble accretion, where pebble-sized planetesimals are accreted onto the surface of that world. And if you're lucky as a planet, you get up to the scale of mass where gas can really rapidly start accreting onto that surface. And we know this has to all happen fast because the disks are gone in one to three mega years. 
But these accretion models that we have, the best physics that we have at the moment, implies that this whole process seems to need to take longer than the lifetimes of the disks. So what's going on? Do we actually have some additional physics taking place here that feeds back into the system in such a way that it's helping accelerate the formation of planets? Well, we know that planet building scatters many, many tiny planets. Disks are quite efficient at turning themselves from gas and dust into tiny little planetesimals, little worlds, anything from the rocky end of them being asteroids to the icy end of them being more comet-like. And our solar system is really good at ejecting those worlds once they're made as well. So here I have a simulation of what happens in a planetary system. This is for our solar system, where you, you have one of those disks, round and flat, and so the planetesimals that get made in it they're on orbits that are round and flat. And so if you look at the top um, one of these plots here, that's the inclination. So that's how flat the orbits are. Below that is the plot of the eccentricity. So this is how much the orbits are tilted or uh, elongated away from being a perfect circle. So look, watch what happens to this disk of round flat orbits when this is excited by a planet migrating outwards. Most of the tiny little worlds, the little asteroids and comets that the solar system made in early in its history, are lost from, the, from our planetary system. They're unbound. They go out and they go off to wander the stars. So our solar system has sent out, you know, um, on the order of at least a thousand trillion, if not more of these, and it's uh, um, in the early stages of its lifetime. A tiny fraction get trapped into the outer trans-Neptunian region, which is an area that I study quite a lot. But so many of them go off to wander the stars. And our planetary system is perfectly normal in this respect. Other stars in the galaxy are also going to be doing the same thing. So this builds up a background of drifting interstellar worlds. And all systems are going to be doing this at different points throughout their lifetime. I've talked a little bit about how this can happen in the first few hundred million years, early in the planetary system's lifetime. But it can happen throughout the system lifetime. So when the, the star is um, in the main sequence of its life, kind of it's a pleasant, happy middle age like our own system is at the moment. The tides of the galaxy itself will tug off comets from the edge of the Oort cloud and they'll go into interstellar objects. And when the star ends its main sequence lifetime, becomes a white dwarf, that little cinder of a star, the amount of mass lost will mean that the Oort cloud of comets that it has at that point will just slowly unbind. Over millions of years, the orbits of the comets will just ribbon out and away, and the Oort cloud itself will become interstellar comets. So planetary systems are really, really good. Not that at making planets, which might be the first thing we think of. Planetary systems are really good at making interstellar objects. And they just wander off. They're like cosmic driftwood, floating across until they happen to bob up against another shore. And sometimes, in our own planetary system, we see that happen here. And we've seen it happen twice so far with the little worlds now known as Interstellar 1, Oumuamua, and Interstellar 2, Borisov. I'll talk a little bit more about each of those worlds as we go through, because these are the ones where we know something about those individual objects, not just the more general concepts of how the big population of them drift between the stars, which we have to think of in more general terms, these ones, we can measure their physical properties. We can actually measure little pieces of another planetary system right up close in exactly the same way that we can for the solar system objects that we know and love, our own asteroids and comets. So what does one of these look like close up? Well, we have sky surveys to tell us about them. 
And these wide field um, imaging surveys are the ways in which we can really detect these objects and pick them up and refine the shapes of their orbits. And that's how we know they're interstellar. They come in on these, these interstellar objects come in on these hyperbolic orbits. They're not bound to the sun. As you could see in the big hairpin turns they were making there. So let's look at the first one of these. Oumuamua came in from the direction on the sky that the, our planetary system is traveling through the galaxy. It did a hairpin turn around the sun, went pretty close to us at 0.15 AU, and headed right back on out again. But it came close enough that we could see it, although briefly, very, very briefly in many ways, less than two weeks to get good detailed information on it. We could see it well enough to be able to be able to measure it with some of the largest telescopes that we have. For instance, this one, the Gemini North Telescope on Mauna Kea, and the Kanda France Hawaii Telescope that you see in the background there. Now, the nice part was, I've been involved in a survey called Colours of the Outer Solar System Origin Survey. And we've been making a map of about 100 trans-Neptunian objects, the little worlds out beyond Neptune, and recording their colours very, very accurately. And so we had a reference sample which we could compare when Oumuamua came through the system. So we tried measuring it in exactly the same way. Now, it still get a little tricky because what was Oumuamua going to be like? Well, it formed out at, you know, when you think of how a planetary system makes small worlds, there's the small volume near the star, which is where the rocky worlds form, and there's the big volume away from the star, which is cold enough that ices can condense. So on average, a planetary system is going to make a lot more comets, more icy worlds, than it makes rocky worlds. So before 2017, the argument was, if you just pick an interstellar object at random, the one that you're going to see is going to be like a comet. It's going to look something like this. It's going to look beautiful with a great mane of, a, of tail streaming out behind it. Well, then we got to Oumuamua. And this is what it looked like in the optical and in the infrared. And there is no lovely big streaming tail. <laughs> you can see some cosmic rays streaking across the image a little bit there and the big long horizontal streaks of stars, which are pulled out long because the uh, telescope here, you know, you have a 300 ton telescope and it's moving like a ballet dancer to be able to track this near Earth asteroid, which happens to be an interstellar asteroid. And this is a point source right there in the center of the, each of those images. And that little point source doesn't have a fuzzy tail coming off it. There was very little material being shed from Oumuamua that could be detected. But this is great because it means we're seeing the direct surface of this object. It's not clouded. It's not obscured by coma. You can compare this to the other solar system populations where we also see their surface directly, like asteroids and trans-Neptunian objects. So let's have a look at what that color stacks up as. So this is what we could measure with Gemini. Here's the color of the sun. And I'm going to do this in a color color space. So how the surface of Oumuamua reflects light in the optical part of the wavelengths and also in the near infrared color. So this is kind of the um, bands through G, R and J bands. J bands out at 1.2 microns. So here's the sun, this nice ye yellow diamond here. Asteroids and Jupiter Trojans, uh, kind of inner solar system populations, have very defined surfaces in this kind of space. The asteroids form a tight clump. The Jupiter Trojans form two different clumps, one of which overlaps with the asteroids. Trans-Neptunian objects, on the other hand, form this big, more widely spread range in colours. A lot of them are very red on their surfaces as well. So where does Oumuamua come in this? It's here. It's right in, I'll just blink that so you can see it. There we go. That big red star, that's Oumuamua. It has a surface that's a lot like a Jupiter Trojan asteroid, 
but also a lot like some of the trans-Neptunian objects. But it's not like an asteroidal surface. It's not reddish in that very asteroid, rocky rich way. It's more like something that's icy, but being quite dehydrated. And this got even stranger when we started to piece together all of the, together with the colors, we started looking at things like how this uh, uh, light curve of this object looked like. So how bright it was um, over the course of the 10 days or so that we could see it with the biggest telescopes in the world. And this light curve varied really strangely. So if I kind of, let's see, what do I have? Well, here is my phone. <laughs> if you start to think what tries to make, you can see something where you see a little bit of the phone and then you see more of the phone and then you see less of the phone again. And so depending on the shape of something that's reflecting light, you can get quite an extreme light curve out. And so the best kind of light curve model that you can have for something like Oumuamua, well, it's basically long cat. <laughs> but we do have objects that are this strange in our own solar system. And we didn't know that at the time Oumuamua came past. So it caused a lot of excitement over how we could have something that's this strangely shaped. But then the New Horizons spacecraft flew past a little world that would come to be called Arakoth. And this is Arakoth. This is the first trans-Neptunian object that's on an orbit in situ that we've ever been able to fly past. So I have worked with a lot of trans-Neptunian objects, but they're always unresolved dots of light for me. Here we can see the surface features. And Arakoth doesn't have many craters. Those two lobes of which it's made They've docked together really gently at about human walking pace is how fast they came together from the lack of deformation that you see where the neck region is. But putting their flyby imaging together with the occultation information that we had to, um, from the New Horizons team making measurements at a whole number of different places around the world as they measured how Arakos uh, blocked out the light from stars that it passed in front of, they were able to piece together that the shape of Arakoth is really interesting. It's like two flattened pancakes joined together. And so we have a um, program with Hubble Space Telescope looking to see just how common objects like Arakoth may be in the cold classical Kuiper Belt. But the strangeness of this shape which wasn't predicted by the planetesimal formation type theories. This told us that things like Oumuamua, where you have this strange elongate shape, maybe a bit flattened, like the you know, photo showing, <laughs> it's kind of flat. These flattened pancake shapes, these are actually pretty reasonable to think about having in planetary systems. But it took seeing the strangeness that's on our own doorstep here in the solar system, for Oumuamua to seem a little more in keeping. So I worked with a uh, um, amazing group of folks at, uh, in the last two years. Here we are um, in Bern in Switzerland, in times when we could have face-to-face -face meetings more easily. And uh, with this group, which was known as the International Space uh, um, Science Institute Oumuamua team, we started to put together a picture of what we could say about interstellar objects as a whole and what Oumuamua might be able to tell us more generally. So you can basically think of it as a skyscraper-sized little yeah, either space cucumber or overstuffed pita bread. Now, there was a very slight amount of change in Oumuamua's trajectory as it went past the sun and past us. And we could measure that through images through, from the Hubble Space Telescope and things like that. And this change in the trajectory is something that comets do a lot. And it has a technical term, which is non-gravitational acceleration. For a comet, this is really straightforward. For something like, you know, it's outgassing. It has material coming off the surface. You can see it really well. For something like Oumuamua, 
it got a little more challenging because we couldn't, even with the biggest telescopes we had, we couldn't resolve that coma coming off. We had to infer it from the change in the trajectory. And that tiny amount of change, the amount of material that you would need to have outgassing off this skyscraper-sized object, you would need basically a suitcase worth of carbon dioxide ice to be subliming. Or if you spread it around the whole skyscraper, that's less than a millimetre thick. So there wasn't very much ice subliming off this little world, but just enough that it's nudged its trajectory very slightly in a way that was really easy to measure because we were observing this in such detail, which is also something that not all comets get. Now, it didn't get cooked very much as it went past the sun, so there wasn't a lot of volatiles to drive off. So these days I think about Oumuamua as being something like a desiccated comet husk. That we were able to pick up Oumuamua at all, well, there's a lot of these. The number that has been seen by the sky surveys to date tells us that at any time, even right now, there's one of these objects that would be inside the orbit of Mars, one little lonely skyscraper that just happens to be meandering through the solar system. But if you add this up going between the stars, there's a lot of these little worlds. Now, they're a tiny fraction of the mass of the whole galaxy, but numerically, there's a lot. So, I started to think about this further, together with uh, um, some of the colleagues from the ISSI team, um, primarily Suzanne Falsman. What are the implications when you think about a galaxy that is filled with drifting interstellar worlds, these tiny little asteroids and comets that drift between the stars? So the primary thing that myself and Suzanne have been looking at is how these would affect the formation places of new planetary systems. Now, planetary systems form in molecular clouds. These are the birthplaces of them, parts of these huge, tenuous um, places get a little more dense over time and then gravitationally collapse. And when they collapse, they're going to take in the interstellar objects that just happen to be passing through them at that point in time. And giant molecular clouds are really big. So given that you can have 10 to the 15 interstellar objects in a cubic parsec of space, when you have five volumes of five cubic parsecs on a side that are collapsing to make a new planetary system or a new um, core and clump of planetary systems, that's a lot of interstellar objects that you can incorporate into a new planetary system. And that means you're looking at a system that's forming not just out of gas and dust. You have a bit more to work with. You have bigger seed-like objects. And this isn't the only way that you can get a macro-scale object of a skyscraper size or a bit bigger into a new planetary system. If Jeannie Grisham and collaborators proposed uh, with a full-worked hydrodynamic setup, that you can actually use the disk of a planetary system to this gas and dust I was showing you earlier with Alma. One of these would act as a tiny little scrap of flypaper to catch passing interstellar objects. This is less efficient than just scooping them up as the molecular cloud collapses, but it's a completely independent way that you can get it, that you can acquire interstellar objects into a forming planetary system. So the fun part of thinking about this is, do planetary systems seed planetary systems? And I'm not talking about anything astrobiological here. I'm talking about how rock and ice go into forming new worlds of rock and ice that eventually grow and develop into planets. Now this hypothesis doesn't make you the first planetesimals in the galaxy but it does imply that it works as a feedback mechanism, where once a planetary system has started to seed the galaxy with a whole little set of floating interstellar worlds, 
the subsequent generations of planetary systems have a little bit more to work with, little nucleation points in much the same way as a little bit of dust can help a rain, a rain cloud get started. And you can think of this on a really big scale, if you like. Galaxies merge and grow by collisions and by incorporating their stars and gas and dust. They're going to bring in their interstellar objects with them. So this hypothesis is still at an early stage of development. And one of the things I've been really enjoying working on the last um, year or so has been looking at some of the implications of how this goes further. And I hope to tell you about some of those at a future time when I've got some of this work through peer review. For the moment, I've been quite <laughs> happily preoccupied dealing with the second interstellar object. So this one was found by an amateur. And on the left here, you can see Gennady Borisov, who is an amateur astronomer who works as a technician at the Crimean Astronomical Observatory. So his day job is building telescopes. And then for fun, he goes and builds telescopes that he observes with himself. And so this is a, a much more comet-like interstellar object that turned up. And this one is very much what everyone thought the first interstellar object was going to be like. This is your full-on proper cometary tail. And so 2i Borisov, so it's the second interstellar object, so 2i, i for interstellar, and Borisov, because this one was named um, for Gennady himself. This object has, uh, was found uh, um, in late last year, and telescopes all around the world have been observing it since. So the first thing we were able to do is because you can hear, and here you can't see the surface of this comet directly, but you can measure its chemistry much more easily. Because here you can see how light um, passes through and, and interacts with and is emitted by the gas coming off the surface of the comet. So this is subliming icy. And the first thing that was noticed, um, as Alan Fitzsimmons and collaborators showed, was in the near ultraviolet part of the spectrum, you can split up the light from this comet and see the emission of cyanogen. And this is a really common molecule to see in, um, in solar system comets. But then things started to get a little bit weirder. And it's been an absolute oh, huge campaign of telescopes and observatories trying to observe this. We, got re we really started get getting going in October last year. And there was observations taking place all through um, the closest approach of 2i uh, to the sun. It was still well outside the orbit of Mars, but, you know, it, it didn't come nearly as close to us, unfortunately, as Oumuamua did. But uh, you take what you get. You don't get to pick these things. And so 2i. Well, we were able to observe it in the ultraviolet, in the optical, but because we can see it for months and months, we could get much more detailed observations than we could for a more more. And of course, we can get really high resolution spectra that start to say things about what this object is made of. Because we can see, say things about what it's made of in much more detail, we can start to even make implications about what was its home star like? What was the planetary system in which it formed? Was that similar to our solar system or was it different? So I've been working with a team on observing with the very large telescope in Chile's instrument called MUSE. And this instrument really is a delightful octopus. What you're seeing here is this is MUSE and this is the I'm trying to think this is the 24, I think it is components of MUSE. And what it is, is it's a thing called an integral field spectrograph. So if you imagine, if I go back here, a spectrum like this one, except not as far um, into the blue part of the spectrum as this, it, MUSE can take spectra in the optical. But if you look at an image like this, so this is Hubble Space Telescope um, making an image in the optical, and it's just making an image. It makes it a one wavelength, one small range of wavelengths because it has one filter on it. What MUSE can do is for every pixel, every element of this image, it makes a spectrum. 
So when you see something like this, what it's doing is it's splitting up the light that it receives from the comet. So you don't just get an image uh, at one wavelength of light, you get an image for a whole range of wavelengths of light. So it makes effectively a data cube. And these are huge. These are hundreds of gig of gigabytes to work with. So, and we've been observing this, what are we up to? We ended up with nearly 20 epochs of observation as body self made its closest approach past, um, past the sun and past us here on Earth. This is what MUSE looks like on the telescope. So you see the big um, shining reflection of the, the VLT, uh, of UT4s. Uh, um, this is the number four of the four <laughs> very large telescopes. It's, they're pretty amazing. Yeah. And so you can see the reflection off the mirror there. The light bounces back up to the secondary and then down, down and you can see the little um, mirror that it bounces off in the set in the center there of the primary mirror and then the lights directed into muse which is sitting there on the right hand side you can see all its octopusy bits uh, over on the right and so muse has been great so let me show you a slightly simplified version of what it's been able to show us so far so here is the uh, um, the spectrum that you see and so instead of being in the near ultraviolet part of the spectrum like we were the earlier spectrum. Now we're looking in the optical. So this is um, 480 nanometers through to 920 nanometers. So this is light of the sort your own eyes see. And the big um, emission features that you see here, these spiky up and downs, a bunch of these are from Earth's atmosphere, because this is a ground-based telescope, but a bunch of these are from the comet. And they very clearly show the signature of diatomic carbon, C2, the, what's known as the swan bands. You can see those over on the left, that kind of big hearing. And lots and lots and lots of lines from NH2. And NH2 is one of the daughter products that happens when ammonia is split apart by sunlight. So the ammonia is coming off the surface of the comet, being split apart by sunlight. And then the daughter product um, NH2 is what's detected in our spectrum here. So we're taking this, the chemical fingerprint of this comet. And the production rates of this, as the comet came in closer to the sun, they started to kick up a bit. So we're actually seeing some change in how that happened over time. So we're seeing into the, the, the primordial material of the comet as far as we can. So what can we say about Borisov? Is it unusual or is it solar system-like? Well, it's only slightly depleted in diatomic carbon, but it's quite enriched in, um, in NH2. In, um, and so that daughter molecule, yeah, you, so if I show you this um, plot over on the right here, this is a whole set of solar system comets in the histograms. And that vertical black line, that's where 2i Borisov falls. And there's only two solar system comets that are more enriched in NH2 than it is. So it's pretty unusual that way. And the other way it turned out to be pretty unusual was two teams. My, um, I was involved in one of the teams involving with the um, Hubble Space Telescope and the Swift Space Telescope that observes in the ultraviolet. And there was another team who, simul who were also observing um, body self with the ALMA space, uh, with the ALMA ground-based telescope. In the remember ALMA, seeing those disks uh, um, of forming star systems. ALMA can do a lot, and one of the things it can do is chemical measurements of comets. So between our team with Swift and Hubble, and the other team um, with ALMA, we measured at very different parts of the wavelength: them in the submillimeter, us in the ultraviolet. And we found that Borisov has far more carbon monoxide than you typically get in the solar system comet. There's one comet that's ever been found that has that much. And so this background image here, you can see Borisov, this is the big fuzzy thing near the nice spiral of the um, galaxy here. So this is a Gemini image in the background. Borisov turns out to be not a twin of a solar system comet. It has some aspects of its chemistry that are very solar system-like and others that are very much from a different star. 
And my current favourite idea of the kind of stellar system and planetary system that Borisov would have originally called home is that it would have been something around a much dimmer star than our own sun, something cool and small, like a, a red dwarf, an, an, M, an M type, an M dwarf star. And the reason we think an M dwarf is they're cooler. So there's quite a lot of region of the disk that's cold. And carbon monoxide is a kind of bolshy molecule. It likes getting up and getting going. And it will do that as soon as it's heated even a little bit. It starts to sublime really far out in the solar system. So for, it to have, for this comet to have survived with a cargo of carbon monoxide and get all the way to the solar system before finally subliming under the heat of the sun and releasing that, it had to form a long way out from its star. And so it seems pretty... M dwarfs are the most common type of star in the galaxy. So for Borisov to have formed at an M dwarf seems pretty much the best idea that we have at the moment. Now, the nice part is, eventually, we might be able to get to go and visit one of these objects up close. So I'm involved in a mission called Comet Interceptor, which is uh, um, under planning at the moment with the European Space Agency to launch in 2028. So we're, we're preparing it at the moment of how the whole mission's going to work. It's a small, it's a small mission. It's about the size of a coffee table coffee table with two chairs pushed in next to it. It's a three-part spacecraft. And it will launch up and go and sit out beyond the moon in the Lagrange point out there. And when we get to the point of having an, a newly found interstellar object or a brand new comet from the edge of the Oort cloud that drops in towards the sun to be heated for the first time, the mission will fire its little rockets and pounce and it will go out and visit this new comet. And it splits into three. So there'll be the mothership and two little subspacecraft that fly off, and they'll be able to look at the comet from three different angles, which is something we've never been able to do before with a comet. So maybe next time we get an interstellar object up close, we'll be able to measure its chemistry from all different angles. But the thing about Comet Interceptor that's particularly strange is that we're sending it to an interstellar object or new, dynamically new comet that hasn't been found yet. But there's a survey for that. So the Vera Rubin Observatory, so a legacy survey of space and time, formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, they kept the acronym, LSST was good. The Vera Rubin Observatory, is this huge telescope that's under construction at the moment in Chile. And this telescope is going to be able to make a truly revolutionary map of the solar system for us. And that means all the interstellar objects that are currently passing through the solar system as well. It'll do a six color movie of the whole Southern sky, imaging the sky every three nights for a decade. And that starts in a couple of years. So with that, we'll get about 6 million minor planets known in the solar system, upwards of the, from, given we only have about 800,000 known at the moment, this is going to be pretty transformative for solar system studies. But for what I'm talking about here, it'll be really fun because we'll get at least an interstellar object every year that the survey's running. And so that means we potentially have, if one of them's on the right trajectory, we might be able to send Comet Interceptor to it. The only issue we have at the moment is the launch of mega constellations that's taking place is a really big effect on wide field sky surveys. So this is uh, what it looks like to an astronomical sky survey when the Starlink satellites pass through it. And the Starlink satellites are currently launching at the rate of 60 every two weeks or so. So they're planning to have about 1,500 up, um, probably, I would say, in the next 18 months. And they have approval for 12,000 of these to launch. Now, the SpaceX Corporation that's launching them has 
under some pressure from astronomers, uh, agreed to try modifying the satellites to see if they can reduce their brightness to sky surveys and to visibility for everyone. But we have no guarantees at the moment that any other company that tries to do the same thing will be good enough to work with the general public and with astronomers on this. There is currently no legislation whatsoever that governs the optical brightness of mega constellations of satellites. So this is something to think about as we move forward into the future of what do we want night skies to look like? How do, how do we want satellites to be perceived? Having said that, I think we live at a time that is really interesting. We're putting together the theoretical information that planetary systems make these vast numbers of interstellar objects. And with the discovery of the first two interstellar objects that we can study in detail, we're finding out that they have some similarities, but they also have some really interesting differences from the tiny worlds that we see in our own planetary system. And these are great because this is direct evidence. We can have these worlds up close and do exactly the same measurements that we do for solar system objects. How did planetary formation differ around other stars? These are the objects that can tell us. And just maybe this huge drifting background of interstellar objects that's now come much more into the forefront of astronomers' minds. Maybe these are important for accelerating the formation of planetary systems. It's an exciting idea and one I'm looking forward to working on a great deal more. So I'm very happy to be back in New Zealand and uh, working with you folks. And I will be, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Michelle. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, we've got just one question in the chat so far. If you uh, mm -hmm. if you want to get anybody else wants to get any questions in, make sure you do that quickly. Um, this is from Ken Holtz, and he says regarding the change of trajectory um, due to mass loss of uh, Oumuamua. I can't even pronounce that. How do you pronounce that, Michelle? Oumuamua. Oumuamua. <laughs> So yeah, regarding the, first the change... messenger arriving from afar, it's um, a beautiful Hawaiian word. So regarding the change of, of trajectory due to mass loss, who did the analysis and how difficult was it, or is it very straightforward for your average astrodynamicist? So the analysis from that uh, um, was led to, uh, by, uh, um, let's see, this was Marco McKelly out of uh, um, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, published uh, um, the first paper on that and it's been looked at by a number of people since. So there's a few things that go into being able to define the trajectory of an interstellar object. Um, one is that at the time that this was discovered, we now have a very precise map of where the stars are, of, uh, um, because the Gaia spacecraft has been very accurately mapping the nearby stars for us. And so to define the trajectory of any little um, world in the solar system accurately, you have to measure it relative to the background stars. So we have a much better star map than we ever used to. So that was the first part. The other part is interstellar objects go really fast. They're not bound to the sun, so Oumuamua was travelling at, what, um, 30 and a bit kilometres per second. And so that speed actually means that despite not being seen for that long, for you know only a, a couple of months in the end, the, um, even with the additional Hubble Space Telescope observations they were able to make after it was too faint to be seen here on Earth, that few months of arc at high velocity means that the trajectory could be very accurately measured. And so even tiny amounts of non-gravitational acceleration from outgassing could be detected. And you can do that actually much more precisely than you could for some solar system objects. Like uh, um, there's a, a population called damocloids, which are on comet-like orbits, but are effectively inert, a lot like Oumuamua. And it's a bit harder to measure non-gravitational acceleration for those, so people do try, just because they're not travelling as fast. So, yeah, this is, a, I think, tiny non-gravitational accelerations is something that 
um, solar system astronomers are going to get a lot better at studying over the next while because Gaia's going to put out data release three and that'll help again. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thanks very much for that answer, Michelle. Uh, we got another question from Bus Driver saying, how long do you think you might have to wait for an object to send Comet Interceptor to visit, um, i.e. how long, how often do these new objects appear? So we're actually hoping that we can identify a target for Comet Interceptor potentially even before the mission launches. So we have, uh, um, so LSST will start operations in what are we in? 2020. So with the, um, you know, there's been a little bit of slowdown at the moment because, of course, <laughs> no one anywhere in the world can do anything that involves uh, um, telescope construction at the moment for obvious reasons. So that's put a few months uh, of uh, um, slight delay on things. But I, I expect by uh, um, at the very latest 2023 where LSST would start observing. And so with that, we have at least five years of observation before um, Comet Interceptor launches to map out the solar system and detect comets out beyond. We'd, we'd be able to, with LSST, you'd be able to pick them up while the comet is still out beyond Saturn. And so the comet has to keep traveling all the way to get into our orbit here you know, at Earth. And so we can potentially pick up and evaluate potential mission targets well ahead of the mission of the mission getting to a point where we could actually even fire to go off and intercept it. Once it does get into its Lagrange point, it has a five-year lifetime. So we we have a good a good long window to be able to identify a really ideal mission target. Very interesting. Uh, another question from Niven, uh, which is, I understand that our sun is a second generation star within the life of the Milky Way. How, uh, how much of the stuff in our solar system is from the sun's precursor versus interstellar, interstellar stuff? Well, technically, uh, so this, I mean, there's a couple of ways I could interpret that. Um, in terms of the interstellar object hypothesis of how how much of what our planets are made of or what our asteroids are made of, for instance, would you expect to be from interstellar objects? A tiny, tiny fraction. So an interstellar object, something like Oumuamua, it's the size of a skyscraper compared to our planet. You know, it is the most tiniest fraction of 1% of the mass of the planet as a whole. And planets change. Their geology means they differentiate and they mix up their material. So you wouldn't necessarily expect to find like, you know, a little thing right at the center of a planet that was the thing it all collected around. It's not necessarily how this would work. However, you might have some of these that don't end up as planetary seeds. And so they end up becoming part of the planetesimal population, the small body population of uh, asteroids and uh, um, trans-Neptunian objects or comets that we do have in our own system. So you might be able to pick up one that way. Uh, but, you know, our own planetary system, as you say, it's a second generation one. And we already have a population that's got a very established literature of study in it, which is uh, um, pre-solar grains. So we're used to finding grains of material in our uh, meteorites and that that definitely create, predate our own solar system. And of course, on the more general sense, all the elements that make up our planetary system were made in past generations of stars. Uh, thanks for that, Michelle. Um, another question from Mark Smith. If you can determine what an interstellar object might be made of, is there any evidence that different systems have other elements yet, as yet unknown to us? So the the best evidence we have this thus far is from two eye bodies of is that the chemistry of the planetary disk in which it formed seems to be different in carbon monoxide and maybe a little bit in diatomic carbon and um, was more enriched in ammonia as well. Now this could mean that it's a more similar disk, but that Borisov formed very much in the outer regions of those of that disk where it was cold enough for all those materials to form out. But I think I'm pretty sure the disk has to be pretty different to the chemistry of our own system just to get so much nitrogen in it, uh, so much NH2. 
Fantastic. Well, that is the last of the questions that are in the chat, unless anybody's got anything really quickly. But if not, then, um, yeah, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much, Michelle. I thought that was a really fascinating presentation, and thanks for coming along and being part of our live stream. Thanks very much, and pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.